So this month, Sony released the ZV E10 camera. They took all of the greatest things from the ZV1, crammed in an APS-C size sensor, and now you can use all the interchangeable lenses with it and still kept the body size super small as well. Now, I recently just picked one up. That's what we're using right now. And we're going to just pick it a little bit before we show you all the good things about it. You see this on the box here, made for vlogging, made for vlogging, plastered all over it. How can this camera be made for vlogging when it doesn't have inbuilt body image stabilization? I always get it hard to get that out. IBIS, when it doesn't have an IBIS. So it does have digital stabilization. And by the time you turn it up to the level that maybe wouldn't require a gimbal, um, that you could get away with using it on a gorilla pod it crops it so much it pretty much is forces you to go and buy their five to six hundred pounds 10 to 18 millimeter lens so that takes this camera way over to a thousand pounds and then that bigger sensor that you've got you're actually using cropped to use it for video it's very strange that they're also offering a 150 pound discount with that lens it's like sony sort of knew that but i think there's better options out there if you want yourself a 4k vlogging camera but what this camera is perfect for especially for its price 650 pounds for the body and 750 pounds with the kit lens this is the perfect streaming youtube content creation camera so right now we've got it going through a elgato 4k 60 pro mark ii but you can also use the cam link with it we're shooting at 4K, down sample to 1080p. I'm doing 25 frames per second because all of my B-roll is at shot at 50. So I've got that nice slowdown speed for the B-roll. Shutters at 1 and 50. We're at f3.5, ISO 400 on a Viltrox 23mm at f1.4. Now we could really blur the background with this lens, but I like to show off a little bit of my fancy stuff in the background. So that's why I've uh, gone for f3.5 today. So you can still see a little bit behind me. Now, I've got loads of things to cover in this video today. I'm going to show you how you can use the ZV-E10 as a UVC USB camera, no software. And we're going to compare it against the Logitech C920 for you as well. Um, so I can show you the quality that you can get just on using a USB cable, no capture card needed. We're then also going to compare it to the old camera that I was using as my main face cam before my ZV-E10 replaced it, the A6400. I think that the ZV-E10 is a better option when it comes to video than this just because it's cheaper but we're going to talk about all of that stuff and then we're also going to compare it to the a5100 all side by side as well and that is why i've got the zve 10 and i'm super happy with its release time because i was going to buy an a6300 to essentially replace my 5100 that i have on a on a boom arm and i use for overheads and all of that stuff that's how i've been recording all my unboxings but i wanted two 4k cameras for it even though i put most of my stuff out in 1080p I just find it's nicer to have 4K for the crop factor. Um, it's just really useful, especially when you're looking at like small little parts for unboxings and all of that stuff. So this is the part of the video where I'd probably say, go make yourself a drink, you know, pause it, get some snacks, because we've got a lot of stuff to cover. I put time codes for all of it. Um, I just want to share all of my knowledge with you with all of the Sony cameras that I've had, all the APS-C cameras under a thousand pounds that I've had over the last 12 months. And I actually researched all of the other ones heavily before buying all of this stuff. It was a massive investment trying to do all this multi, you know, camera stuff that we've got going on here. So before we get to all the video stuff, I want to talk about all of the cameras. So from the A5100 up to the A6400, I'm not really going to talk about the 65 or 6600 today. I'm going to tell you, you know, all of the features that they've got the same, all of the places that they're different and things that will maybe sway you to one of the other cameras and then I'm going to talk about all the things that only the ZV-E10 can do. So let's talk about all the things they share in common then. Well they all use the same battery, great. You only have to buy one type of battery. You're going to need to buy extra batteries because the batteries don't last very long. They've been using the same battery for a long time now. It also seems to become a little bit of a joke in every review on when are they going to mix up the battery. But they all use the same, which is great. I haven't bought any extras because I've got three cameras and I generally only use two at once now. So I can bounce those batteries around. Now, they all feature phase detection, autofocus with face tracking. I'm actually shooting a manual today, which we'll talk a little bit about later in the video. But they've all got really good autofocus. Things like the A5100, 6100 and 6300. Their um, autofocus isn't as good as the newer cameras, but it's still very good, as you will see later in the video. Now, the ZV-E10, A6100, A6400, step it up. They've got 425 phase detection autofocus points with face tracking, which I think covers 80% of the sensor. Like, it's really fast. 
but it does come with its own issues, which again, I will show you later in the video. And finally, the main reason why you're gonna wanna buy any of these cameras for streaming or content creation is that they all feature clean HDMI out. This means that you don't have all of your info sort of down here, like shutter speed, ISO, you don't have all of your other things going up here. And more, most importantly, if you're using autofocus, you don't have a square around your face. Okay, so they've all got clean HDMI on, really easy to turn on. And even if you're not a streamer, I would recommend you go down this route with Sony's cameras because, you know, memory cards are more prone to failure than hard drives. Also as well, while you're recording through OBS, it just gives you a bit more flexibility. You can maybe do some color correction over the top, maybe apply a LUT so it's all ready to go as soon as you put it in Premiere. You can add lots of other stuff like audio effects, just so much stuff that can save you time. And you can shoot in higher bit rates as well. I'm actually do all this through an RTX 3070 graphics cards. You don't need to go that heavy. Anything from a 1650 Super and up will get you really good NVENC um, recording through OBS. I think the first thing we're going to focus on straight off the bat, because this is going to be a big killer for a lot of people on the ZV-E10. It doesn't have an electronic viewfinder. And if you are into photography as much as you're into videography, the ZV-E10 wouldn't be for you. And I'm really surprised, even if it was going to be an overpriced accessory, that Sony didn't release some sort of hot shoe connection EVF. Now the A6400 does have it and so does the A6100. A5100 does an A6000 and A6300 do as well. Now, if you were into photography, you'd be thinking I won't buy the ZV-E10 and I'd get this, the little brother of the 6400, the A6100. But I would still push you towards spending a bit more and getting the 6400 if you're into photography. The reason is, is that the A6100 doesn't feature any of the advanced picture profiles like S-Log and HLG. I'm just using the standard picture profile today. Um, but if you were into video too, you know, just having all of those picture profiles, even if you don't use them at the beginning, they're still there. The 6100 doesn't. So for me, I feel like the 6100 is a bit of a redundant camera. Next up, video formats and what do they shoot in then? So the A5100 and A6000 only shoot at 1080p up to 60 frames per second. I think the 6000 might do 100 but through hdmi anyway you're only going to get up to 60 now i need to shoot at 25 or 50 because i'm in the uk so i get flicker if i shoot at 30 or 60 fps now the a6300 all the way up to the a6400 including the zve 10 all shoot up to 4k 30 frames per second and 1080p 60 as well out of the hdmi i'm sure i'm probably missing a couple of formats there the a6300 is prone to overheating though when you record um 4k footage it has had some firmware updates but it's still prone to do it it's nowhere near as bad if you use the hdmi output um, and also use a dummy battery as well that keeps the heat down one thing that's worth noting and all of the cameras that do shoot 4k that i'm talking about today is that you only get face tracking autofocus in 4k if you turn off in body recording so you have to re record to a um you know output so maybe something like a um you know, external recorder or like what I'm doing through a capture card into OBS. Next up then flip screens. Now the A6000 and A6300 do not have flip up screens. You can get these little adapters that you put into the hot shoe. It's like a mirror. But for me, that's a big reason why I wouldn't buy one. I was only going to get the A6300 because it wasn't going to be used as a, a very good demo as a um, face camera. Do you know what I mean? It was going to be a top down camera. Now, you could get an external screen for those cameras if that's all your budget suits. But by the time you spent that money, you're starting to step into ZV-E1 territory anyway, especially when you're looking at this six, 12 months later down the line and you can get this camera second hand. And again, with the A6300, if you were going to use that front screen, you know, buy an external monitor and then you're shooting in 4K, no face tracking autofocus. So I would recommend that you would put it in manual. So that's for me just kills off both of those cameras now the a5100 the 6100 6400 zve10 all have flip screens but they do it differently so the 5100 is fine because it doesn't have a hot shoe so that's fine and i like this flip up style okay i like the flip up style because it keeps you focused centrally on your camera lens okay it keeps you focused on the camera lens but it does come with its own issues so on the A6400, it gets in the way of the hot shoe connector. Same with the A6100 as well with that flip up screen. Um, that means if you're putting something on like external mics, little lights, it's going to be in the way. But it's not the worst thing ever. I've got on here just a tiny little hot shoe that fits on the side of it. 
you could also get yourself a camera cage as well one benefit as well with the camera cage well a couple of benefits is that it's going to keep your camera protected if you drop it and it's also very good for dispersing heat when it's getting warm because you've got that extra metal there now the zb e10 screen flips around and you may think you like that more because then obviously we haven't got that hot shoot issue it actually becomes with two of its own problems one you start to look away from the center of the camera lens it's not too bad on this camera because it's quite small on my lumix g9 people were always saying that i wasn't looking at the camera lens i, I struggled and i was getting people were whinging all the time because i was just staring being vain staring at my face um on the camera display okay it's also a nightmare once you've got this camera fully locked and loaded up with cables because they're all on the same side that the screen flips around so now I've got while I'm monitoring myself now I've got two cables in my way if I had this fully loaded I would have four cables in front of my screen so personally I don't really like the screen on the ZV-10 next up mic inputs then the A5100 and A6000 don't have microphone inputs the rest of the cameras do you may think this isn't a problem because you're going to record your audio externally especially if you're streaming but this is again it's one of those features it's better to have it and not need to use it I don't use mine very often, but you know, I've still got things like the video mic NTG that I'll plug into it. It does come in useful. Um, you know, there's a couple of bits in the video where I use this microphone because I don't want a, another big microphone in front of me. And finally, for the differences, then power. Okay. Now, the 6100, ZVE10, and A6400 all allow USB power while you've got the camera on, meaning that you're not going to run out of battery so much. This can lead to the camera being a bit warmer though because it's always trying to charge the battery. So I would still recommend using a dummy battery. They're about £20. Now the 5100, 6000 and I'm pretty sure the 6300 all require you to have a dummy battery. Okay. As for the 6100 and the 6400, they use micro USB but the ZV-10 has USB-C. So that's a big, big prop there. You just need to get rid of your micro HDMI now but it's hard because of the size of your camera over to the things that only the zv e10 can do then only the zv e10 can do my favorite thing is that it's got a headphone jack i didn't realize how much i missed that from my lumix g9 but being able to monitor your audio um, especially when you've got an external mic put into it i think it's brilliant sony's actual mic input settings i really like anyway there's loads of gain control in there and it does show you the actual decibels as well so it is pretty decent anyway, but just being able to listen to it, hear how you're sounding, you know, is the mic too far, too close? All of that sort of stuff, very important. There's a couple of other features as well that I'm not going to cover in this video today because I'm doing separate videos, but product showcase, meaning that it doesn't lock onto your face so much when you hold an item up. Um, defocus, which blurs your background. Now the ZV E10 is the only camera out of all of these, minus I think maybe the A6600, which features eye tracking autofocus in 4K. Um, don't stress yourself out if you buy this camera and go, why have I got no eye tracking focus in um, video? It's literally just for photography. And finally, and what we're going to get over to now, we're finally getting over to the video tests. I know it was a lot of stuff to cover, but you can use this as a USB camera. UVC compliant works perfect with Windows and Mac. I haven't tested it on my Chromebook yet, but I assume it's going to work because it just sees it like it sees a capture card or a webcam. And I'm going to show you all of that content now. It is super easy to use this as a USB webcam. So the first thing you need to do is this button up on the top here. This changes you between photo, movie, and S and Q setting. You essentially just need to make sure that's on movie. Then you just hit your menu button on the back up here. And it is on the first page of the movie section. You just go down to USB streaming. Press that. And then all you need to do is plug in a USB-C cable. I would recommend getting a longer one because the included one's really short. And there you go, boom, straight away. Obviously I did have to add the device in OBS beforehand, but that is it. No software required other than what you wanna be using with your camera. So here it is then on the left, we've got the Sony ZV-E10 coming through at 720p, 25 frames per second. And on the right, we have the, what's it called? The Logitech C920 coming through at 1080p. and they both hold up very well. The C920 can look a lot better than this. I don't have masses of natural light coming in here. Um, so smaller sensor cameras just don't work for me. That's why I don't review a lot of webcams. It's not from the one to, it's just the fact that I don't have a very good environment to do it in. And this was also more apparent that before I got all my Sony cameras for doing multi-camera through capture cards, 
I was actually going to use GoPros because I thought it would be cheaper and that there'd be enough. And it still added, you know, some extra possibilities for me, but the, just the picture quality was just so off. And it wasn't just, you know, the, the camera's fault. It was more the sense of size with my environment. Because when I was taking them outside, the GoPros and getting footage, it was great. It would have been fine as B cameras. But for me, it just doesn't work in this environment. So I've tweaked the settings a little bit, but you can't massively change it where well, you can. But it doesn't give you the same settings as some of the other C920 models. You get this other version of Logitech thing with no numbers on it. So you're just moving sliders around and trying to figure it out. Now, the webcam does work. You do get webcam audio on this as well. I think I might have the mic turned up just a little bit more, but. So here is just a sound test of the ZV-E10's built-in microphone. Then this is a very large room, but I wanted you to be able to listen to it. Maybe that if you were using this camera, not at your main setup, somewhere where you didn't have an external microphone, this is what it's gonna sound like. If you were gonna use this as a webcam a lot um, and you didn't have another microphone, I would probably recommend at least just getting a little lav mic to clip onto you now it does look good when it's small like this but it's not perfect um this is it at 720p it's native resolution and it still looks okay like it's it's a feature that none of the other cameras have so it's great but when you're at 1080p it's it's not quite there you know you spent so much money on this camera and to have the better sensor and the flexibility of the lenses you need to get yourself a cam link. That's 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 just what I'm going to say. That's that's what you need to do with this. But, you know, for maybe you haven't got the money straight away, you haven't got the outlay, let's put us down to streamer size. A couple of little streamer dudes. Maybe you've got a green screen going on. I mean, both look fine. No one's going to make any complaints about it on your stream. This one, the ZV-10, is obviously looking a lot better but i think you know as a free feature that doesn't need any additional software really easy to run works with zoom works with teams i mean this is something that i'm probably going to take to work with me it means i don't need to take my capture card or the hdmi cable it's going to be perfect as well you know if you don't have lighting in your office you know if you're taking it somewhere else because you've got so much control over the camera we're only at iso 200 today we can crank that right up if we're in some lower lit conditions or badly lit and you would still get a lot of quality and you're not going to have the same amount of noise or the huge amount of noise you would have with a webcam in those uh, sort of environments. But we need to see the Sony ZV-E10, the A5100 and the A6400, how you should be running them in this sort of setup. And that is with capture cards. So let's take a look at that. So getting all these cameras into position behind the monitor was an absolute nightmare. And now if this is tripping you out, seeing too many of me, if you want to focus on the one that's probably going to be in sync with the audio, I would look at the top camera. Um, that's the one I'm going to sync up to the audio. Now, one thing that I decided to do while shooting this bit of the video is that I've done it at night. So we've got no natural light in. That's going to affect the dynamic range a little bit. Obviously going to get a nicer picture out of all of these cameras if we've got a little bit of natural light in the room as well as the artificial light in. But the thing is, if you're going to be using this for streaming, that's what you're going to have. Just a couple of you know LED video lights. Now, I've got one to the right of me here. That's probably about the size of the larger Elgato one. And I've got another one over to my left as well, which is probably about the size of the key light air. That's what's giving me this sort of shadow on my face a little bit. Now we have the Sony A5100 at the top, the ZV-E10's over to the left, and then we've got the A6400 on the right. Now, normally I would shoot at a lower aperture than this. I'm actually currently at F4 because I'm using a different lens on each camera. On the A6400, I've got the 18-105 to and the lowest that goes is to F4. You may notice on the A6400 as well, there's a little bit of focus hunting, which I'm going to tell you about in a minute when we get over to that camera, because it actually affects all of these cameras. Now, the ZV-E10 I'm using with the kit lens and the A5100 I'm using with the Viltrox 23mm. Like I said there, we're at F4. ISO 500 is what I'm using across all cameras. Shutter speed at 1 and 50. Um, and the white balance is set to custom. I think it's set to 5700K on every camera. That's what each camera set itself to um, when I set the custom white balance with one of these things that I've clearly spilt a drink over at some point and haven't cleaned up yet. So let's start with the first camera, the A5100. Now you may be thinking that I've put the lens that I like the most on it to make this camera look better and to give it a bit more of a fighting chance. Not at all, not at all. This is actually the one camera I recommend you don't buy. And it's not because it's struggling a little bit more here at F4. It would look a lot nicer if I was dropping this down to maybe F2 or F2.8, how I would normally use it. But we need to keep it in sync with all the lenses. 
it's the absolutely horrific job that it's doing to my skin. And I just do not understand why people recommend this as a budget streaming champ camera. Okay. Now this waxy skin effect is an effect that's on the camera that a lot of people like if you're a beauty vlogger and you can turn this off. So it's one of the first things I turn off when I set up my camera. Okay. I would turn it off, but as soon as you plug the HDMI on, it turns the waxy skin effect back on. There's only two ways you can get rid of this. The first one with a zoom lens is turning off face tracking autofocus, but it doesn't work all of the time. It only works some of the time. You almost have to hold stuff in front of your face and to really not notice that it's skin, but it's very hard to get around it. The way you can definitely get around it is by using a prime lens because what you need to use is digital zoom. If you obviously want to use digital zoom, the clear image zoom on a zoom lens when it's at say the kit lens at 50 millimeters and you zoom it in a bit, you're going to see that much of your face. So I've just turned on that clear image zoom. And as you can see, the skin's back to the way it should be. Okay. Back to the way it should be, but we've lost face tracking autofocus. So you bought, you think you bought your cheap camera. You've then gone and spent maybe another 200 pounds on a lens for it. It's starting to turn into actually buying a higher end Sony camera. So that's why I don't recommend it. I did forget to mention that we're coming in in an Ava Media Live Gamer HD2 here at 1080p, 25 frames per second, but this camera is good up to 25 or 60 and it works with a capture card perfectly fine as well um, at YUY2 as well. So good color space. Now, one thing that's worth mentioning before we get over to the A6400 is that actually when you shrunk down, when you're not at full 1080p, because I did think the 5100 looked a bit pants, when it was at its full 1080p resolution, they all look pretty decent. Even with the skin smooth and the 5100 does sort of look all right. And especially with the fact that you're probably going to make yourself even smaller because you're going to be down in like the right or left hand corner, maybe with a green screen. They would all do a cracking job at that. So I'm not going to completely turn on the A5100. I just don't think it's as good as everyone says it is for the HDMI output. So the next one is the A6400 then. Let's talk about focus breathing. So what I'm talking for a second about the A6400 and how I've got it set up. Keep an eye on the Captain Pro box as I move around and stuff. Just see what it's doing. So for this one, we're running through the Elgato Cam Link. Okay, the Elgato Cam Link 4K. And um, we're coming through at 4K 25 frames per second, but it's good up to 4K 30. That's with the NV12. Um, color space, but you can also use YUI2 if you drop it down to 1080p 60. Um, it's obviously come down a lot in price now as well since they've been in stock more from the pandemic. In fact, actually, I think it was going for like 80 pounds on Amazon the other day, which is a bargain. And I would massively recommend it over those cheap 10 pound ones. You get so much more picture quality. Yes, it costs, you know, 10 times the price, but it really is so much better. Face tracking autofocus works great on this camera. Thoroughly enjoy it. Like I said, I prefer the flip up screen because it keeps you focused where I should be, even though it's hard not to be distracted by the rest of this stuff at the moment. So focus breathing then. Apologies if I get this wrong because I'm not like a pro video or photography guy, but essentially what's happening is it's worse with a zoom lens is it's making tiny little micro adjustments while it's focusing on my face. So it's going in and out and slightly zooming. And that's why it's moving out a bit. Now, in fact, it can be way worse than this. What you have to do is turn down the drive speed. Um, there's two options in all of the cameras, drive speed, tracking and sensitivity, I think. So I've got that turned right down now, but it still happens a little bit. And part, some of the reasons that that's going to happen as well is because you're sat maybe too close to the lens. You can't really get away from that. OK, you can't get away from that happening when you've got it mounted above there, you know, above your monitor. Um, if I move back, you can see it's not as bad. So again, it's also adjusting to the right focal length. I've noticed it's not as bad with the 18 to 105 if I'm at F8. Obviously, that's going to be well too dark today. We'd have to turn the ISO right up with the lighting that I've got, and I wanted to keep them all at F4. So it's something that I want you to be aware of. And I'm, you know, I don't want you to think that the A6400 is worse at autofocusing than the rest of these cameras. It's almost as good as the ZVE10. It only loses out in eye tracking autofocus. Other than that, it's as good. The same thing happened when I put the 18 to 105 on the ZV-E10. But overall, picture quality is good. The thing that I'd recommend to all of you anyway is because of the way that you're sat, see how I'm sat now. Even though I'm moving around, I'm a little bit animated. I'm quite static. And that's what's going to make this focusing worse. It's not as bad as if I'm walking around. And if you had the camera on me, it focuses very well. But it thinks because I'm static, it just constantly makes these little micro adjustments. Okay, as I mentioned earlier. So I would recommend that you put it in manual focus. 
Sony cameras have this great feature. It's called peaking assist. You can turn it on. I normally have mine to red and set it to high. And then basically it lights up my entire beard red. Dude, benefit of being a man and having a beard. And then it lights up my eyes a little bit red as well. And that tells me I'm in focus. And I'd rather that because obviously, you know, if I did that, I would come out of focus a little bit. But it's better than your whole background going boom, 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 boom. Because it can get quite bad. It looked like there was some motion issues going on there as well. I don't know if my computer is struggling with uh, recording all of this stuff. Anyway, back to the free cameras. Back to the free cameras. What do you think? I like them all. But I love the ZV-E10 the most. Let's have a little look at it. So over to the ZV-E10 then. Now I'm actually running for an Elgato 4K60 Pro Mark II. Okay. Um, so that's getting me, it, that capture card can do up to 1080p 60, but we're limited to the 30p that the camera can do. Again, I'm at 25 frames per second here, but we do get YUY2 as well in that. Like I said, I don't think there's a massive difference in this between the A6400 EVA, but we've got eye tracking autofocus in the video, which is definitely something that, you know, a lot of you might like. Probably a little bit too much shadow on my face. But one thing I do want to note is that um, I had to retake this video quite a few times because it was the first time I've done so many cameras and things were going wrong. And the ZV-E10 did overheat, okay? Um, I have since turned on the non-overheat setting. In fact, the A6400 would do the same thing if I used it the same amount of time. But I've since turned that on. I went away for an hour. Um, so I basically just left all of the cameras on moved away from it all from an hour and it's still on fine and bear in mind i turned it straight back on after i had the overheating issue as well but yeah you just had to turn the extended limits on there i'm also going to leave the camera on for a few hours afterwards as well and if i have any overheating issues i'll let you know but i think it should be fine that was just a scoreboard error for not turning that setting on in the camera and there should be some b-roll showing you it there on screen and i just realized we didn't really do an autofocus of all three cameras did we <laughs> So there we go then there's a comparison of all the cameras all of the great features that the zve 10 offers and all of the great features that the other cameras that we've shown you today offer as well now just an update on that overheating issue honestly it is a completely schoolboy error on my account when i bought the a6400 i'd been researching it for about three months so before i'd even hit record on this i'd already turned that feature on um the heat issue i'd turn that on now i'd shot all that footage on a thursday night and i had friday booked off of work um, because there may well have been a technical preview for what may be probably the biggest multiplayer shooter for the next couple of years. So I definitely had that time booked off. Now, I was up very early in the morning, even though I wouldn't have been playing it till later in the day, um, because I felt like a kid at Christmas. So I was up super early. So the first thing I did when I got up was I turned the ZVE 10 on. I plugged it into the capture card and I just left it on. I think it was probably on about six, seven hours. OK, and no overheating issues at all. It was a little bit toastier than the A6400, but the 6400 is bigger. Another reason for that as well is that I had a USB cable plugged into it that's charging the battery, trying to keep that charged. You can reduce it by using dummy batteries. And also when cage is available, I would recommend them as well. But you can use this for long streams. I don't want to cause a panic. The heat issues are absolutely fine on this camera then. Now, all of the cameras on show today are perfect for streaming, okay? Even the C920 Pro, when you shrunk down low, you know, it's going to be perfect for you. They all do the 60 FPS that you need for those streams, and they're all great. Now, when it comes to content creation, all of the Sony cameras do offer some great features. They're all at different price points, and they're all going to be great for you expanding your channel and making your content and making that growth. But just some closing thoughts on it. For me, I feel the A5100 and A6000 still represent great value for the price that you can get them for, especially because then you can start building some lens and buy a more expensive body at a later date. For me, the 6000 without the flip screen is just an absolute no-no for me. Now, the 6300, I think, is at an awkward price point at the moment because when I was looking at buying it secondhand, if I was getting one that was in very good condition with a low shutter count, 
Most of them weren't being sold body only. They were being sold with the kit lens, which I didn't need. And they were going between 450 and 500 pounds. Now, if you've already got Sony cameras, stepping up to the ZV-E10 for 650 is a no-brainer. No heat issues, better autofocus, face tracking, all of that stuff. Loads of extra stuff. And it's just a newer camera. You're not, it's brand new. You're not buying a used one. So I feel that A6300 might come down in price, maybe six months or 12 months after I've made this video. And then it'd be a bit of a different argument. But right now, I would say you're worth spending the extra money. As for the A6100, I think it's a bit of a redundant camera now. Like if you get one, great, you're going to love it. It's got loads of great features and it's going to be great for photography and video. I just feel it's worth spending a little bit extra on the A6400. Now, this camera should really be close to a thousand pounds with a kit lens, but you can regularly find it cheaper. I got mine on a steal, so I paid the same price for the A6400. I got it for £750 with a kit lens, the same as that, but often it's more selling for around about 850 So it's probably between £100 and £150 more than the ZV-E10. But time is money. You know, that extra £150 could get you a lens. Um, you know, it might not get you a good one, but it's getting close for you to buying a upgrade over the kit lens. But for me, the ZV-E10 is the best of the bunch. Things like having that headphone jack back, um, the size of it, uh, microphone inputs as well, you know, USB-C, eye tracking, autofocus, defocus, product showcase, it's just all of these ex just tiny little subtle features and the fact that it's anywhere between, like I said, 100 and 250 pounds cheaper than the A6400, if you're not into photography, is an absolute steal. And I thoroughly enjoyed this camera. Now, that's it for me today. I've waffled on far too much. But if you have any questions, if you have anything that you need to know more of, let me know because I'll probably make another video on that for you and I'll get that sent over.